Oh, what's happening? Where am I? Sanitarium, a point-and-click horror adventure game from 1998, is one of my favorite games of all time. I'm not alone in that assessment, even though it seems many people have never heard of it. But even if you have played Sanitarium, you probably don't know the secrets I'm about to share in this video. I've been speedrunning the game on and off for the last few years, and I've learned a lot about how the game works. This isn't a review of the game or an analysis of the plot. Instead, we'll take a deep dive into the mechanics, glitches, and incredible detail of this classic game. In case you haven't played it in a while, here's a quick recap. Our protagonist drives off a cliff in the opening cutscene and then finds himself in a creepy asylum with no memory of who he is or how he got there. Diagnosis crazy. From here on, I'm going to be spoiling a lot, so consider yourself warned. Max, our character, escapes the asylum with the help of an angelic statue, only to find himself in a weird town with deformed children and no adults. The game then alternates between the asylum and an increasingly bizarre series of worlds. Not only that, but he takes on the persona of someone in that world. A little girl, a comic book hero, and an Aztec god. Max gradually learns who he is, why he's jumping between realities, and how to get out of his nightmare. It's an intense psychological journey. And now, let's talk about the things you might not have noticed on your first playthrough. Pumpkin Patch Shortcut In the second level, there's an arcade sequence where you fight off crows with a scythe and then battle a scarecrow. Slice and dice, baby. Afterwards, there's a plank that serves as a shortcut back to the main area. It blends in with the ground a little bit, and I've seen a few people miss it completely. This means they have to walk all the way back through the patch, and then all the way back again once they have the items they need to complete the level. Hidden Sound Test Pressing the function keys, as in F1, F2, F3, and so on, will give you a sound test. This works for each of the playable characters. Damn! 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 Grap! By the gods. Foreshadowing the game has a lot of foreshadowing. I'm going to list some of the things I've noticed, and I'm sure there's a lot that I've missed. Feel free to put your additions in the comments. In the opening level, talking with the patients foreshadows the major events to come. Don talks about the spirits of fallen warriors, fallen temples, and calls Dr. Morgan a witch doctor. This refers to the events in a later chapter, The Lost Village. Lenny talks to us about being bad because he ate pumpkin pie from the patch and tells us that mother made everyone go away to school. We enter the pumpkin patch later in The Innocent Abandoned, and the school is where the dead adults are housed. So many corpses! It's horrible! Martin tells us of the bugs that are constantly buzzing and driving him crazy. They're not normal bugs, they're robots, and they want to destroy the world. This refers to the hive and its cybernetic bug enemies. The only good bug is a dead one. This patient will fall off the edge once you get close. Hey, uh, who are you? Oh my god, don't! No! So it's entirely understandable that if you didn't keep your distance long enough, you may have missed this line of dialogue. Watch the death-defying spectacle! Keep your eyes on the high wire! Never before has any circus presented such an amazing feat of balance! This, of course, foreshadows the circus. In the same opening level, there are stained glass windows we can look at. These depict children, as well as a scarecrow, two things we encounter in the next chapter. On the other side of the tower, there are more stained glass windows pumpkins, and a comet. What the hell is that? A comet is the source of evil in the second chapter. Once we get to the second chapter, Marty Johns tells us about his toy ball and his fondness for rides. This reminds Max of a ball he used to have, and all of this is reminiscent of the red ball and rides in the Circus of Fools. What the? There are also circus posters in many of the rooms, foreshadowing the same chapter. Continuing the circus foreshadowing, we find a stained glass window with clown faces in the courtyard and chapel. There's also a weird looking tree that comes back in the Morgan Cemetery. The tree, it moves! When you listen to Morgan's recording in the laboratory, he tells the asylum workers to get an old man away from him because he's too old for the experiments. Get this wretch out of here. This is the same man we free from the morgue just a few chapters later. Dr. Morgan was there. He, he looked at me and 
said I was too damn old for his purposes and... In the cutscenes in the early game, we see Max reading a Grimwall comic book, referencing the Hive. Grimwall is the four-armed Cyclopean hero of that chapter. During the level The Mansion, we can go into Max's room and see a Grimwall poster as well as a Grimwall toy. Whee! <laughs> as we learn more about Max's background, we discover that he was a doctor trying to find a cure for a disease called DNAV. There are radios throughout the game that give additional information about this, which can be easy to miss on your first playthrough. Today the world mourns as children who successfully responded to the hope drug begin to die. <laughs> Red Herring A red herring is literally a red fish, but is also a figure of speech, meaning a misleading clue. There's a red herring painted on top of this shack. Damn, useless crap. And I was so sure that I would find some clues in here. This patient is holding a red fish and will dance with it if you play the correct music. I hope he only dances with a fish. And you can pick up a red herring in this temple. A ruby fish. Its blood-like coloring must indicate something important. Puzzle Solutions In the laboratory, there's a magnetic locking puzzle. So I only realized in editing that it might not be magnetic. I was probably thinking of electromagnets, but that's not actually indicated anywhere in the game. So, yeah. In the laboratory, there's a magnetic locking puzzle where you have to turn a wheel around, and you can only unlock some of the clamps at a time. I've seen some unnecessarily complicated solutions online, and the simplest way is to just alternate back and forth. Click the switch, then the wheel. Do that eight times, and the puzzle is solved. I used to think that this wasn't the intended solution because it seems too simple, but there's a clock elsewhere in the level that seems to hint at it. This clock is running counterclockwise. The time is one o'clock and the alarm is set to eight. Except that bit about counterclockwise is a little misleading. You can turn the wheel either direction as long as you're consistent. In The Innocent Abandoned, there's a lock to the pumpkin patch with a three-digit combination. The most obvious solution is to take the chapter and verse from the church sign. But there's an alternate way to figure out the solution hinted at on the gate itself. You can also get a hint by talking to Maria, who says it has something to do with Jesse and in her loss. Do you know what that means? I'm not sure. If you play Jesse at tic-tac-toe and win, she'll tell you who else she is lost to. Talk to those girls and you'll find out how many times they've won. You actually have to go back and forth a little because one of them misremembers her total. My liar pants on fire. She only beat me four times. Finally, you get this line of dialogue. So Meg beat me four times, Eileen beat me five times, but you only beat me once, Mr. Smarty Pants. This is so convoluted, I can't help but imagine the devs realized it was too difficult and just slapped the solution on a sign out of frustration. It doesn't even make sense. It's based on how many times Jesse loses at tic-tac-toe, but the combination would have been set before she played the game with Max. Except it does make sense in hindsight because but then again, playing tic-tac-toe is optional, so if you don't do it, shouldn't the combination be 4-5-0? If you got lucky during your playthrough, you might not have realized that it's possible to lose at these carnival games and to lose all of your tickets. Oh poo. If you do, head down to the beach where some tickets will be waiting. The number of tickets you get is random, and I've seen values between 1 and 3. At the last puzzle in the Morgan Cemetery, you can exit the puzzle by pressing control. None of the other puzzles exhibit this behavior, and I don't know why. This isn't useful for anything, but it does mean you can solve the puzzle, quickly exit, and not have the game progress. Yes! Once you play Simon Says with the jack-o'-lanterns in the gauntlet, the kids inside sing Ring Around the Rosie. Unless you turn the ambient sounds off, in which case the song is skipped. Finally, in the last chapter, there's an IV running into Max's arm that represents the poison making its way down. When the poison reaches Max's vein, the level resets. This may be obvious to some people, but the first time I played the game, I was so focused on the puzzle that I didn't even notice. 
Where are we? The geography of the sanitarium is never made entirely clear, but we can get a small hint in the chapter of the laboratory. If you look to the left of the locking puzzle, you can see the outline of a previous level, the courtyard and chapel, down below. The darkness and rain can make this difficult to spot. Version differences. All right, now we're gonna get into some really technical details. There are two different commercially available versions of the game for the PC, on GOG and on Steam. The GOG version seems to be essentially the original 1998 game. In 2015, a company called Dot Emu released mobile ports that included a revamped interface, autosaves, and a hint system. They also released a PC port that doesn't have the interface, autosaves, or a hint system, but it is different from the original. This is the version you'll get if you buy it on Steam. If you play the game in full screen, the GOG version runs in a stretched 16x9 aspect ratio, while the Steam version is in the original 4x3. To play windowed, there's a menu option in the Steam version, while in the GOG version, there is no menu option and you have to pass the command line argument hyphen W. Playing the Steam version windowed appears to run identically to playing at full screen. The GOG version is a bit different windowed. It's now in the correct aspect ratio. The Windows cursor is visible at all times, which can be annoying casually, but helpful if you're speedrunning. The in-game cursor disappears during animations, and seeing the cursor lets you position it better. Also, running the game windowed can cause the GOG version to crash during cutscenes. On my old computer, this wasn't a problem, but after upgrading, I couldn't get past the first VCR puzzle. For some people, enabling direct draw emulation solves this problem. This didn't work for me. I had to find some fan-made direct draw DLLs and put them in the game folder. Oh, and since I couldn't find a better place to put this factoid, passing in the parameter forward slash skip will make it so that when you start a new game, the opening cut scene is skipped, as well as the long dialogue between two asylum workers. Most bizarrely, the windowed GOG version is very inconsistent when it comes to character walking speeds. Apparently, walking speed is very much affected by what's running on your PC. In fact, on my old computer, I was able to make Max move consistently faster by going into the task manager and increasing the thread priority. This doesn't work on my Ryzen CPU. To give another example, I was running the game at a marathon and I beat my personal best by minutes even though the run was objectively worse. The only difference that I could tell? I was broadcasting at 520p instead of 720p. This is probably the biggest reason I stopped speedrunning the game. There was no way to create a level playing field. That is, until I recently discovered the Steam version, which runs consistently. The only problem is that the Steam version is slower, and not just because Max walks slower. Before Max interacts with anything, most of the time he has to look at it first, giving a descriptive monologue. A crowbar should come in handy. In the original GOG version, this monologue can be skipped by pressing the escape key. In the Steam version, there's no way to skip it. I also found some music-related bugs in the Steam version. The wrong music is playing in the chapel where you meet Preacher Bob, for instance. And the music volume would sometimes spike when transitioning between areas. Boss fight differences. In the cave, wading your way to the squid monster, stalactites will fall from the ceiling, potentially hitting you. That is, they fall in the GOG version. In the Steam version, the sound effect plays, but no stalactites fall. In the pumpkin patch, when you get to this bend in the path, if you're running the GOG version, a crow will spawn right on top of you, almost guaranteeing a hit. The Steam version fixes this. Okay, so I had this issue with the crow for years. I mean, you, you can clearly see it in this old speedrun, but when I went to capture it to make this video, the crow doesn't spawn that way anymore in the GOG version. I, I have no idea what's going on here. In both versions, there seems to be a dead zone where you can't swing your scythe. Menu. Let's take a look at the menu for a minute. In the keyboard configuration, there are shortcuts for quick saving and quick loading. 
By default, quick save is capital S and it's case sensitive. If you tried quick saving without holding the shift key and it didn't work, that's why. The quick save goes in save slot 25 here at the very end. You can manually reload it, but quick loading is broken. It just doesn't work. There are also several options obscured by question marks. In the penultimate level, The Gauntlet, you can switch between the different personas by selecting the corresponding inventory item. Who am I now? You can also use these shortcuts, which are only revealed when you get to the level. S for Sarah, G for Grimwall, and O for Olmec. I don't think that hardly anyone realizes this, because it's at the very end of the game and these shortcuts are only used on this level. In the GOG version, there are options to adjust performance. I'm not entirely sure on everything this affects, but I do know that setting it all the way up turns off ambient sounds. The Steam version replaces this with the option to turn full screen on or off. <laughs> Movement glitching. Sanitarium has a unique control scheme. To move, you have to hold down the right mouse button. When you let go, Max stops walking. But if you hover over an object that you can look at, then left click and right click at the same time and hold, Max will continue walking even after you let go. This only works the first time that you look at an object, and in some levels, mostly the smaller ones, it doesn't work at all. In terms of a speedrun, this is useful in the Steam version because you can listen to the descriptive monologue while walking over to the item. An empty old gas can. It's less useful in the GOG version since you can just hit escape. It also allows for this glitch in The Innocent Abandoned. After finding Dennis in the schoolhouse, Max walks up to the corner and waits while Dennis runs back to the town square. Come on! But if you have the glitch active, you can click on Dennis to initiate the dialogue and then walk out. Because you're not inside, the game can't do the pathfinding. This skips not only Max's animation, but Dennis's as well. <sighs> Movement glitching with pause buffering. In between some screen transitions, the cursor is visible for just a few frames. So if you pause buffer by holding down escape and then left and right click on the return to game icon, Max can move when he's not supposed to. A few useful examples are during the cutscene transitions in The Innocent Abandoned, or after talking to Mr. Baldini in The Circus of Fools, or after giving the sacred symbol to Preacher Bob. In the hive, if you do this as Graven leaves Gromna's pod, it's possible to get in front of him, making him despawn and skipping his long walk off screen. Here at the grandfather clock, you don't even have to pause buffer. You have about a half second of control after solving the puzzle. If you're moving when the in-game cutscene starts, you can get a head start in walking up to the den. In the GOG version, you can also do this in between pop-up puzzles, like after the water puzzle, It looks so much nicer when it's filled. Or the magnetic locking puzzle. If you're quick enough, you don't actually have to pause buffer, but this is much harder and requires near frame perfect precision. Aha! If you have direct draw emulation enabled or are running the Steam version, this transition happens too quickly to pull off. New Game Plus. After you beat the game, if you save and then load that save, you'll be put back into the last level, but the lights are out. You can still click on things and you can hear footsteps if you start walking. I tried playing it blind for a few minutes to see what would happen if you win the game again, but I gave up pretty quickly. Disappearing Juggler. When you hold down escape as a dialog box comes into view, most of the time you'll see the text flash for a second. Occasionally, you won't see any text at all. I did this once at the juggler, and he disappeared. This meant getting the red ball was impossible, and I was softlocked. I've only seen this once, ever. Postmortem. If you're interested in how the game was made, there's an excellent write-up available online. I'll put a link in the description. One of my favorite details is that the team members couldn't decide on what the game should be about, so their director of creative development suggested making a game with all of the ideas, which explains a lot. 
Thank you for joining me on this deep dive of what I consider to be a classic, and a big thank you to my patrons as well. If you have any love for Sanitarium or games like it, know that you're not alone. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.